there are basically two things which grow in parallel as society evolves, right? There is the, the power of our technology, and then there is the wisdom of us humans for how to manage the technology. Robot power! If technology grows faster than the wisdom, it's kind of like going into kindergarten and giving them a bunch of hand grenades to play with. The robots are here. Some of them look a lot like us. Others, not so much. But robots are getting more mobile and smarter by the day, thanks to the U.S. military funding research and development in advanced robots and artificial intelligence. Some people are excited about our evolving relationship with the machines. They're a great tool that humans can use to make their lives better and make the world a safer place. While others are deeply concerned about the dawn of intelligent killer robots. There is nothing that the U.S. develops in the military sphere that it does not want to weaponize. Virginia Tech, the uncanny valley of robotics. Due to its proximity to Washington, D.C., Virginia Tech has become an incubator for military R&D, and it's home to a handful of labs on the leading edge of robotics research. Our company is building a building right down the road there. So in the interim, we're leasing this garage space. So. My name is uh, David Connor. I'm a senior research scientist with Torque Robotics. Who's behind you? This is the Atlas robot that was developed by Boston Dynamics. Uh, it's an evolution from the Petman project a number of years ago. This robot was developed specifically for the DARPA Robotics Challenge. There are about seven of these in the world, uh, distributed to a number of teams competing, developing their own software to operate the robot and control it. Teams behind the country's top semi-autonomous ground robots have come together for some friendly competition. It's part of a multi-year contest hosted by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, the Pentagon's Blue Sky Research Lab. This atlas here is one of 11 robots competing in the finals this summer. Can it, like, grasp me or do something? No, no. It can't grasp <laughs> me? Not. Would it crush my bones? Yes. <laughs> the, the general rule is you're not within 10 feet of the robot when the hydraulic pumps are and it's under control. Oh, man, that's heavy. <laughs> Don't want this punching you. Wow. There's sort of two side-looking cameras, a stereo camera pair. Uh, these are just lights, and then this is a laser range finder that spins around and gives you a point cloud of distances. And then that's what we communicate back to the operator. It sort of looks like a, a Terminator. Do you get that a lot? We get that a lot, but this is a nice, friendly humanoid rescue robot. It is a machine, and it will serve whatever purpose its human operators send it to. I've never stared into a robot's soul before now. It's a bit unsettling, and it leaves me with more than a few questions. What's the end goal? You know, what, what, what sort of tasks does it do? This robot was designed specifically to explore research topics and rescue robots. We want to have a system that you could send into a disaster zone, could make use of human tools. That's why it's more of a humanoid form factor. It could still probably hurt me though, right? You drove here in a machine that's more dangerous than this. And, and so it really is about the safety precautions we put in as we're operating it. And then it's ultimately it's the purpose that someone will put it to. Meanwhile, across campus at the Trek Lab, we meet another robotics team gearing up for the DARPA challenge. How you doing? I'm Brian Latimer, and I'm one of the co-advisors for the Trek Lab. We do robotics and controls for robotic applications. Uh, the center of the lab here is the robot Escher. We have uh, about 20 graduate students, uh, undergraduate students, working on this robot in all different aspects. So we've actually fabricated this robot here, and we have people working on the mechanical side as well as the software side, helping the robot see the, the world in front of it and manipulate real objects in the world, like door handles and chairs or valves or things like this. A lot of people do see this and they think of an artificially intelligent Terminator that's gonna turn on everyone and bring about Skynet, and that's the end of humanity. The robot that we're developing is more like a C-3PO that is 
doing actions that we don't want people to be involved with. Brian Latimer and the other Virginia Tech engineers competing in the DARPA challenge have seemingly the best intentions. They're building tools they hope will help humanity. DARPA and Google-owned Boston Dynamics, the company that manufactures Atlas robots, declined being interviewed on camera for this story. According to DARPA, Team Valor, which is developing all of the hardware and software for its Escher robot in-house, has received roughly $3.5 million in DARPA funding since the beginning of the challenge in 2012. Teams like the one from Torque Robotics, which are developing just the software for their Atlas robots, have each received upwards of $2.5 million from DARPA since the challenge began. And depending how the finals play out, both of the Virginia Tech robot teams stand to win one of three cash prizes, and of course, prestige. But some critics are skeptical about DARPA's interest in robots like Atlas and Escher. This is part of the Nobel Prize. Oh, at the fancy dinner, these were on everybody's plate. Jody Williams won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997 for her work in banning anti-personnel landmines. Nowadays, she's taking that same fight to stopping killer robots. I support the ban on killer robots. Do you? Can you tell me about the campaign to stop killer robots? Sure. I was doing a piece on drones, the CIA, mercenaries, and the US military. And in the research, I came upon the fact that they were being called, for example, the Model T of future robotic weaponry. And I was, in all honesty, freaking out, you know, saying, I can't believe this. You know, where's the morality? Where are the ethics? Why do people think it is okay to create machines that on their own can target and kill? And I started pushing that we needed to bring together people we'd worked with on other campaigns and launch a campaign to stop killer robots. So we launched the campaign in London with a peaceful robot. His name is David Reckham. Ban killer robots. Ban killer robots. I want to stress the campaign does not oppose robotics. It does not oppose artificial intelligence. It opposes putting all that together in machinery that can kill you by itself. She's talking about autonomous robots, which can make decisions on their own without humans in the loop. Those robots don't exist yet. But in her research, Jody has encountered bipedal robots like the ones we saw at Virginia Tech. And she's worried DARPA's grand plan is much more sinister than semi-autonomous search and rescue. You know, when I saw Atlas, only thing I could think of was when are they gonna put, you know, machine guns or whatever they will ultimately decide to put on it. The line we kept getting is that these are service-oriented robots. They're here to help humans. And then they will be helping humans kill. When they tell you that they will not be weaponizing them, I want to know what they're smoking. There is nothing that the U.S. develops in the military sphere that it does not want to weaponize. But what about something like a bomb defusing robot? The U.S. military has been deploying explosive ordnance disposal robots by the thousands since the beginning of the Iraq War. They're the little brothers to Atlas and Escher, and they've saved the lives of countless soldiers and civilians. We get a crash course in bomb bots at Fort A.P. Hill, a U.S. Army training base in southwest Virginia. So in the explosive or disposal field, we're early adopters and saw the value in robotic platforms early. In the 1980s, we adopted our first uh, set of robots. So uh, this is a class of the uh, advanced NCO course. So these are all uh, staff sergeants here for training, and part of their training is to use robots. So this is a variety of tasks. You know, how do you get a robot up and down stairs? How do you get it uh, in and around corners? And then uh, how do you use the gripper to pick up, change, pull off, or somehow manipulate the item that you're trying to use? But not using Xbox controllers, right? Absolutely, yes. I don't, don't claim credit for it, but it was one of those conversations that we had one time with field reps, and we said, hey, you know, we already have a whole class of young men and women that are uh, certified to use this. So wouldn't it be great if we could have a controller that did that? And uh, so that is the controller that comes with that robot, because the soldiers are already well-versed in using them. So apparently there's a robot over here that's opening a car door. The folks over here are operating it. 
Looks like it's right here. Colonel Bradley is actually saying this is like, as they've streamlined the technology over the past couple years, this particular bot, the talent, is sort of like their go-to for that. I can't tell if it's purposely coming at me. <laughs> You can see there's a mock explosive in here, and I think it's just about to pull it out. Success. You know, the soldiers be using these robots uh, every day. A lot of the soldiers become very familiar with the robots, and they make up names for them based on their particular attributes. Or, uh, and sometimes those things will, uh, you know, will come up with nicknames. The soldiers do not think the robots are alive, but they also know that, you know, they're part of the, they're sort of part of the team <laughs> as he brings you the cell phone. <laughs> yeah. You can't understate the humanitarian impact of explosive ordnance robots. But one thing we weren't shown at the Army base is what else the military has done to these platforms. They've weaponized them. Why would the military weaponize a bomb disposal robot? Because they can. That's an example of, you know, when they say to you, we won't weaponize the Atlas. Well, if they're weaponizing a robot that did do good service in disposing of bombs so U.S. military will not die, wasn't that enough? Does this confirm Jody's fear that all military machines are inevitably outfitted to kill? You know, the drones just sort of spun themselves out. You know, they started out being surveillance equipment, and then somebody, you know, figured out that if you put a couple of Hellfire missiles on them, you could whack people. Drones are arguably the most recognizable and controversial of today's high-tech military gear. To understand what happens when we weaponize semi-autonomous machines like drones, we meet the Rayman family, the alleged victims of a drone strike in Pakistan. This is what that reported strike looked like from the eyes of a drone. According to the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, drones have killed between 2,400 and 3,900 people in Pakistan since 2004. By the Bureau's tally, at least 400 of those victims were innocent civilians. Between 150 and 200 were children. Rafiq's belief that tension throughout the Middle East over the U.S. drone program is being used by militants as a recruiting tool is shared by some of those on the other side of the computer screen. I mean, we're supposed to be this, uh, this is shining beacon on the hill and all that, being in the United States, you know, with this technology. I very sincerely believe that it's creating more enemies and it's solving any problems. And the precedence that we're setting is disastrous. Adam worked for a U.S. military contractor. He monitored multiple live video feeds from drones flying over Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm not necessarily 
proud of, you know, my participation in the drone program. Eight hours a day, seven days a week, I would sit in front of monitors and monitor up to 16 drone feeds at once, and I would report significant activity. But all we could see, I know from where our vantage point, and that's all that the approving authority could see was heat signatures that were suspicious or were running around or whatever. And then it would take them out, sometimes hitting the target, sometimes not. Sometimes, you know, taking out a, a quarter of a city block. In Afghanistan, you can have a suspected Taliban meeting spot. A drone will observe it, see this suspected meeting is taking place. It may not be a meeting. It may just be a freaking potluck. Hellfire is launched, takes takes out, you know, 20, 30 people in that, in that village. You could take out a whole generation, you know, in that small village. And then think about those adults or those people that are left remaining and what would their opinion of the United States be? Reciprocity in war is something that we never think about. If you attack somebody, in theory, they sh should have the means of responding. A drone makes that impossible. Nobody can surrender. Why do you think all of the terrorist organizations are having no trouble recruiting? Understandably. And we're not even supposed to say that, right? We're not supposed to understand why people in Pakistan might hate U.S. drones, and by extension, the country that is using them. But others, like Christine Fair, a military affairs expert at Georgetown, think we have no option but to use drones in modern warfare. I know people who live in, in South and North Waziristan who are incredibly pro-drone. In fact, they are so pro-drone that they call drones ababil. So in the Quran, um, there's a surah called Surah Al-Fi, which means the elephant passage. And in this passage, the Quran describes an invader who brought an army of elephants to attack the Kaaba in Mecca. And the ababil are these little swallows that dropped black stones upon the elephants to repel them. Because they say drones are the only things that are taking out the terrorists. That their options are to do nothing or when the Pakistani military feels like it, to come in and conduct gross airstrikes, which have displaced millions of people. So there's, there's a cost to not doing drone strikes as well. To me, the opposition to the drones, it's a very dangerous form of luditism, for which I have very little tolerance, just focusing on the military aspects of removing a target. This is the most humane way, because if you, if you fire a missile from an F-16, from a helicopter gunship, from an AC-130, you take out cities, you take out villages, you take out wedding parties. Now, every once in a while, a kid will run into a frame. There's nothing you can do about that. But the question then has to be asked, since we can do this with a drone, why is it humane to use any other weapon system? The desire to ignore blowback, you know, from the drones is ridiculous. And when we move beyond that to fully autonomous killers that can go out on their own and fly around for however long they can fly around and target things, how, how would you feel? The X-47B, which is a high-tech plane that can take off and land on its own, was unveiled and test flown. At the discussions in Geneva, though, they were talking about it that at this point it would not be used in a fully autonomous fashion because of the pressure and the directive from the military saying that they cannot develop fully autonomous weapons. If the inevitable happens, then of course that thing will be used fully autonomously. It is a goal to have these robotic platforms kill things without having a human pilot. Now, do I feel uncomfortable about that? Yes, I do, actually. The X-47B is a prototype that can take off and land on its own. So while it won't ever fly missions independently, it is representative of a new era of autonomy in military robotics. When we talk about that, that precedent that the that mm -hmm. drone seems to have set, mm -hmm. you know, how is that going to shape the future of Atlas or, or Escher, are they going to be going the way of the drone, so to speak? I believe so. 
Some people will argue no, um, but I think they're obfuscating. Back at Virginia Tech, it's finally time to see those controversial machines doing their thing. Robot power! This six foot tall, 330 pound bipedal humanoid robot is about ready to take a walk. And there you have it. So I'm not quite sure what the problem with the initial walk was, so you got your robot fail video. Um, <laughs> it's really cool when it works, and it's frustrating when you have issues. But it worked in the practice this morning. <laughs> we'll get it to <laughs> We're thinking that they, if we may be having an issue with one of the, the sensors on the feet, and it's due to go back to Boston Dynamics for an upgrade in the next month, so we haven't worried too much about it. Robot power! Atlas eventually gets moving, albeit very, very slowly, almost agonizingly so. And it's going to be picking up. That's the intent, is yeah, we want to walk, walk over and then pick up the drill. If I were in a burning building and this thing was dispatched to save me, I probably wouldn't make it. It can't be argued that Atlas failed the drill test, a task it will have to perform at the DARPA challenge. Only today, it was pretty slow. Okay, but what about Escher? I have to say, first contact with Escher, AKA Thor, is pretty thrilling. So what's the coolest trick this robot can do? Uh, some of the neat things that we can make it do are stand up on one foot, push it around, and what's neat about this is uh, Thor right now is basically moving around as if his eyes are shut. But Thor's reaction time is so quick that he's able to stay standing. And he's also using his whole body controller. Uh, and the whole body controller keeps him to count everything, the arms, the legs, all the ligaments, where all of his uh, moments of inertia are. Is that too hard? That was a little bit too hard. I think I hit it a little too hard. Escher manages some impressive stuff. We try to make the robot be able to do things that humans can do, like stepping up on blocks or stepping on rubble, having that rubble shift underneath his feet. And if the ro if people are able to do it, we should be able to make our robot be able to do it as well. Um, and so that's what we've been doing as we test. And since it graced the pebble bed so easily, we decide to put something a bit more real world in its path. Robots are hard. Robots are very hard, but some of the hardest things to do are test to show where it fails and then fix those failures so that it won't fail again. Because we have a lot of successes with it, but then there are also a lot of hidden bugs, you know, in the system, and we want to make sure that those don't arise when it really needs to matter the most. We're designing this to help uh, in situations like the Fukushima disaster. We'd be totally happy if the robot was able to understand, hey, there's this disaster, and I am a tool that can help these humans not get hurt. Escher is perhaps slightly more graceful than Atlas, but it's still not like this thing is gonna run you down and kill you. In the time since we wrapped shooting at Virginia Tech, Escher underwent considerable hardware and software upgrades, including better artificial intelligence. And the same goes for Atlas. To get some perspective on the state of robot intelligence, we met up with Max Tegmark, 
a physics professor at MIT. People's imagination is so limited, you know? They think that if you make something smaller than us, it's just gonna be a tiny, tiny bit smaller than us. As if, like, we are only a tiny, tiny bit smaller than snails. Tegmark recently co-authored a paper with renowned cosmologist Stephen Hawking. Their op-ed didn't say AI is inherently bad, but Hawking and Tegmark warned of a possible doomsday scenario if we don't start putting regulations on AI right now. To me, the really important development to watch is not the ability to build machines that look like humans with two legs, but rather the ability to put really smart brains in them. These machines so far have a very narrow, limited intelligence. And by simply replacing the software by the state of the art from five or 10 years from now, they will be able to do dramatically better things. If we develop uh, extremely advanced um, AI that has military use, it's pretty likely that the world's militaries are going to start using it, regardless of what the geeky professor or whatever who developed it thinks about that. Techmark thinks there is a bigger precedent here, the bomb. Some of the scientists who designed the atomic bomb, in fact, most of them, did not want it to be dropped on civilians in Japan. There was a James Frank report that said, hey, let's just detonate it in an atoll in front of some Japanese admirals and generals and get them to surrender. But the scientists weren't the ones who got to make that decision. So could robotics be heading down the same path if we're not careful enough? There are basically two things which grow in parallel as society evolves, right? There is the, the power of our technology, and then there is the wisdom of us humans for how to manage the technology. If the technology grows faster than the wisdom, it's kind of like going into kindergarten and giving them a bunch of hand grenades to play with. We have no clue what would happen if we were to ever succeed in making machines that are much smarter than us. If people tell me, oh, I know exactly what's going to happen and it's going to be great, I would take that with a grain of salt. For Jody, there's nothing about the march of robotics that should be taken with a grain of salt. The United States has never met anything in its military arsenal that it did not want to weaponize. So to say that you have this six foot six inch robot who they are working feverishly to make more mobile, to not be still tethered to the cord, et cetera, et cetera. You're gonna tell me that they're not going to put machine guns on that guy and send him into urban warfare? I want to know how they can convince themselves that that might be true. And when I'm in a really bad mood, I wanna know why they'll look you in the face and not.